Welcome back everyone to another reaction video. We're going to go back to our friends at Extra History today. I want to talk about one of my favorite stories from the First World War. You guys know my passion for the First World War. And uh, as I began to immerse myself in the history of that war, I very early on learned about this unit, the Harlem Hellfighters. And I was just blown away by their story. It's absolutely amazing. And so I wanted to bring it to you today. If you're not familiar with them or if maybe you're a little familiar and wanted to learn more, uh, we're going to take a look at Extra History's video on this. And I'll put the link down in the description and stick around to the very end uh, because I'm going to be showing some additional things related to this beyond just the Extra History video that we'll be reacting to. I want to look at some other more modern things that have to do with this story. So join me on the journey. Here we go. Outpost 20, Argonne Forest, 0200 hours, May 14th, 1918. Two soldiers, Privates Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts, stand alert at the outpost. Though American, they wear French helmets and belts over their U.S. Army uniforms and carry French rifles. A bullet whizzes by. German snipers, they're under attack. They hunger down in their dugout and line up grenades. Suddenly, a noise. Someone's cutting through the gate. Roberts decides to run for help, but falls wounded, and he makes his way back to Johnson to help him chuck grenades at the enemy until they both run out. Switching to his rifle, Johnson holds fast against a determined German assault, but he runs out of bullets. And in the confusion, he mistakenly loads an American magazine into his French rifle, mm. jamming it. As German soldiers storm into their position, Johnson resorts to swinging the gun like a club until he takes a blow to the head. Fighting to stay conscious, he sees three enemies grabbing Roberts. Johnson draws a bolo knife and prepares for his final stand. He slashes and stabs three of the enemies, then descends into a berserker rage. Ignoring gunshots to his face and hands, he attacks the German squad with such a fury that they flee. And when reinforcements arrive, they find four dead enemies and evidence Johnson wounded ten more. He will be promoted to sergeant, receive an award from the French, earn the nickname Black Death, and become the most legendary member of the Harlem Hellfighters. I let that whole story go without interrupting because I wanted that story to be told. And we're going to talk more about Henry Johnson at the end. We're going to watch a uh, ceremony uh, at the White House concerning him long after his death. Um, starts out like any normal great hero story, right? I mean, we're talking Alvin York, uh, guys like Audie Murphy. Uh, men who do these great things and get recognized for it. But that's where this story changes because this wasn't just any guy. He was a black soldier in a segregated black unit in the American army that didn't even have the opportunity to fight with their fellow Americans because that's how they were viewed by the United States government at this time. Uh, so this is a, a story of heroism. It's a story of... Uh, overcoming. It's a story of one of the best units in the United States military during the First World War, maybe the best unit. Uh, but it's also a story of um, just the realities of what the culture was in the United States, and especially in the Army, a hundred years ago. As we continue to educate ourselves on black history in America, we urge you to join us in supporting highly important charities, such as this week's organization, Black Veterans for Social Justice, which service vets, their mm. family members, and their communities. Learn more and donate via the link below. Three years into World War I, the United States joined the conflict after Germany sank a number of her merchant ships. And despite their poor treatment under Reconstruction and Jim Crow, many of the nation's African-American men eagerly enlisted. So think about that right away, right? Put yourself in that situation if you can. You are a black man in America uh, in a time when there's deep racial divide. Um, you know, even in the North, a lot of places you are not viewed as equals. And in some places you are, and it depends on the person, obviously. But your country goes to war. And you volunteer to fight for this country that has so mistreated you. And this is during an administration, Woodrow Wilson's administration, in which black men who and women who serve in the government have largely been shut out of a lot of federal government jobs uh, or forced into difficult situations. And yet they sign up and they enlist and they, and they choose to fight. And they believe that this is going to prove that they are every bit the equal of white men. 
it's not to be. They saw the war as an opportunity to prove their worth yep. and challenge stereotypes. And they did. Initially, they were turned away. But then the Secretary of War initiated a draft. Ohio man, Newton Baker, is buried in the same cemetery as President Garfield. Uh... Lakeview Cemetery in northeast part of Cleveland. That included all able-bodied men between the ages of 21 and 30, including black men. But even before the draft, members of the African-American community, including veterans of the Spanish-American War, had actively lobbied state governments to form African-American National Guard units. The white politicians had no interest in supporting the notion until the governor of New York approved the idea and appointed white veteran Colonel William Hayward to organize the recruitment. And this is pretty common. You, know, you go back to the American Civil War when you first have large uh, national units. I mean, you, you had black soldiers fighting in previous wars, but um, this is where the first mass scaled uh, recruitment of African-American troops. Um, and you have like 200,000 of them who fight in the American Civil War. But black men couldn't be officers. They could be non-commissioned officers. You could rise up to be a sergeant, even a sergeant major. But um you had white officers, and so you have the same thing happen here. The men assigned to this new regiment, the 15th Infantry, many of them from Harlem, New York, reported for service on July 25th, 1917. So it's important to note when he says 15th Infantry, it's the 15th New York National Guard. This is not the same as the 15th United States Infantry that would be later famous as a part of the 3rd Infantry Division. Audie Murphy was in the 15th Infantry Regiment, uh, not the same unit. At New York's Camp Whitman. They initially stood at over 2,000 mostly black and Puerto Rican recruits, with nearly another 2,000 on their way, thanks in part to the draft. But as their numbers grew, training proved difficult due to lack of space. But then they received both good and bad news. The good news, the Army found a suitable training camp. It's in the South. The bad news, it was Camp Wadsworth in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Now, think about the stupidity of this, right? You... I get that they're saying there wasn't somewhere else to send them and they needed a training camp. But why, 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 why in 1917 would you send an almost all black unit to South Carolina to train? The local reception was predictably racist. Yep. Before they'd even arrived, the Spartanburg Chamber of Commerce issued a letter claiming the most tragic consequences would follow the introduction of the New York Negro with his northern ideas into the community life of Spartanburg. These are United States Army soldiers. These are men who are going to go and fight and die because their country called them to. And you're going to do this to them? I mean, it, it angers me to no end the way these guys are treated. I get it. I know this is 1917. This is the South. This is the way it was. That doesn't mean I can't be, you know, just want to throw stuff at these people and just do far worse, really. They were, in essence, implying that a black U.S. troop would be met with violence. And while that turned out to be an empty threat, Plenty of Spartanburg's businesses refused yep. to serve the black soldiers, which prompted Camp Wadsworth's white soldiers to boycott those establishments in solidarity. Good for them. Well done, men. Well done. Meanwhile, in the heart of the war, the French were under pressure and low on men. They called on the United States for reinforcements. So under the command of General John J. Pershing, an entire U.S. brigade that included the 15th was shipped to France as an autonomous unit. For the beleaguered men of the 15th, even the trip was rife with difficulties. It took them several tries to even make it out of American waters after a mechanical breakdown, mm. an onboard fire, and a collision during a blizzard forced multiple returns to port. But finally, on the 27th of December, the men of the 15th arrived in France. And so this makes them some of the first troops to arrive, right? I mean, the Americans are arriving in large numbers throughout 1918. But 1917, it starts out as Pershing and his staff, guys like uh, General pa or future General Patton, um, George C. Marshall are on his staff. Uh, but it's a skeleton crew at first, and then men start arriving. And so these guys are going to be some of the very first American units to go into combat. Only to be relegated to digging and other backbreaking labor. If you notice a bunch of parallels between the story of the 369th and the story of the 54th Massachusetts in the American Civil War, the movie Glory, that's because there is. There's incredible parallels here. Uh, but 
they haven't made a movie about these guys yet, and I cannot understand why. I mean, somebody like Spike Lee or somebody, step up and make a movie about this unit. Despite the fact that Pershing was supposedly an advocate for black soldiers, he was stuck in a racism sandwich. On one side, many of his white soldiers refused to fight alongside blacks. And on the other, many high-ranking government officials advised it might be bad for his career if he integrated his troops. And this might be why, after a few months, he decided to loan his black regiment to the 16th Division of the French Army. Redesignated the 369th Infantry. In so they're redesignated because they're going from being a National Guard unit to now being an American uh, a federal, they've been federalized. National Guard units are state, they're almost like state militia, uh, so to speak. It's not exactly that, but um, so they've been redesignated 369th Infantry, but almost everybody remembers them as the Harlem Hellfighters, even though they weren't all from Harlem. In May of 1918, these men would finally get their chance to fight, and after two months in the trenches, they were reassigned as part of an Allied counterattack. For the most part, the French seemed grateful for the reinforcements. And in what must have been a nice change of pace for the men of the 369th, their race was not treated as a negative. This was partially due to the French having a long history of men of color serving in their ranks. From the revolutionary general Thomas yep. Alexandre Dumas to... Whose son wrote The Three Musketeers, Man in the Iron Mask, stuff like that, Alexandre Dumas. But yeah, absolutely. It's so unfortunate that these American soldiers had to come to France and serve under the French in order to be treated as equals. Many colonial soldiers from Morocco and Senegal. Then in September, the 369th Infantry forged their legacy. In a fierce battle, they captured the town of Seychelles with one of the white American officers, Lieutenant George S. Robbs, taking charge of his platoon after their superior officers were killed. And as he and his men doggedly took out snipers and machine gun nests, Robb himself refused to leave the field despite multiple combat wounds. Holding Seychelles gave the Allies a strategic advantage. But the 369th had done almost too good of a job, as they'd outpaced the French troops that were supposed to flank them. But by the time they received the order to pull back, they had already stormed 14 kilometers through heavy German opposition. It was a victory that cost them 851 men. The U.S. awarded Lieutenant Robb the Medal of Honor for his actions, while the black men who fought at Robb's side would receive no such official commendations. But they had earned a host of unofficial titles. From the Black Rattlers, due to their rattlesnake insignia, to their French nickname, the Men of Bronze, and also the moniker that frightened Germans had started calling them Hellfighters. And that one stuck. The Harlem Hellfighters. Even with the late start, the Hellfighters spent 191 days in combat, more than any other U.S. regiment. And though they suffered casualties, they never lost a foot of ground, right. and none were ever captured alive. They took more cat I mean, let's sum that up again. They took more casualties than any other American regiment. They never lost a single man captured, not a single one, and never gave up a foot of ground, never retreated once. And I believe they were the very first American unit to reach the Rhine River, the border right there with Germany. Some 40 of them, when they weren't fighting, band, even yeah. served as morale boosters by being part of the regiment's Hellfighters Band. Led by the legendary composer James Reese Europe, the band is said to have played for the wounded as well as military and civilian audiences. And it's also credited to have introduced jazz to Europe. the French and British. Yep. Ironically, not only did a man named Europe forever change music in Europe, he also paved the way to international acclaim for the likes of Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong. While the U.S. government withheld medals from these brave men, the French did the opposite. After Seychelles, Croix French Command awarded 171 Hellfighters the Croix de Guerre for their actions. And a Harlem Hellfighters the monument cross. stands in Seychelles to this day. Not to mention the same award had already been bestowed on Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts for their brave stand in the Argonne Forest five months prior. Henry Johnson was not even given a Purple Heart, at least not right away. Even though he was wounded, I think they counted like 23 wounds on the guy. Uh, during that fight uh, that they told at the beginning of the story. But sadly, those honors meant little when the Hellfighters returned to the U.S. In February of 1919, they returned to New York, only to find that they wouldn't be allowed to march in the victory parade with the white troops. So think about this. These guys, they take more casualties than any other American unit. They never lose an inch of ground. They're, you know, 
out in front. They're take. They're just doing as they did probably more than any other American regiment, and they really did think they were going to come home and it was going to be different. That people were going to hear of their exploits, going to recognize that these guys are heroes, and give them a hero's welcome. And they couldn't even march in their own army's parade in their own city. They had to have their own parade. Thankfully, Colonel Hayward was able to arrange a separate parade that started on Fifth Avenue and ended in the heart of Harlem. There, thousands of well-wishers and families greeted the Hellfighters with cheers as the Hellfighters band led the way. Henry Johnson also enjoyed some notoriety, but once the war was over... I believe it was Theodore Roosevelt who called Henry Johnson one of the five best soldiers in the war. He was not wrong. The army cut him loose. The fact was, most veterans from segregated regiments never received their promised benefits or even any medals. And despite 21 combat injuries, Johnson did not receive the Purple Heart. And he never fully recovered from the physical nope. and mental damage he'd sustained defending Outpost 20. His marriage in tatters and physically unable to hold down a job, he died penniless in 1929 at the age of 36. Died at 36 years old, a legit American hero treated like a third-class citizen. Uh, I think he got tuberculosis, ended up, he did eventually get a, a full um, pension from the U.S. government in the last few years of his life, but largely forgotten, dies in 1929, and for a long, long time, that was the end of the story. He was buried in Arlington. Other hellfighters would also meet tragic ends, including James Reese Europe, stabbed in the neck by a bandmate. And another Hellfighter private, Leroy Johnston, would survive the war and the long journey home, only to be lynched in Arkansas during the Elaine Massacre of 1919. But their legacy lived on. The Harlem Hellfighters paved the way for later African Americans in the U.S. Army. From the Tuskegee Airmen to Benjamin O. Davis, who was commanding the 369th Hellfighters in 1940, when he became America's first black brigadier general. First black brigadier general, yeah, he commanded the 369th, became a brigadier general, I think, in 1940. His son uh, became the first U.S. Air Force brigadier general, was a Tuskegee Airman. Um, I think he rose to, like, colonel uh, at first, and then ended up a four-star general at the end of his life. In 2015, President Obama posthumously awarded Johnson the Medal of Honor. Prior, President Bill Clinton awarded Johnson his long overdue Purple Heart in 1996. And I think at that time they also gave him the Distinguished Service Cross for that action, which was then upgraded during the Obama administration. We're going to, in just a minute, I want to watch the Medal of Honor ceremony. But these modern honors hardly compensate for the treatment these brave men received after serving honorably. As we rekindle conversations about how America can live up to its promises, we must never forget the sacrifices of men like those in the Harlem Hellfighters. And remember that all who answer the call to serve their country deserve a hero's welcome Amen. when they finally come home. Absolutely. Until next time, everyone. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at that ceremony. Okay, so I'm not going to show the whole thing. I'm going to pick up right at the end of the president's remarks and then uh, show the actual awarding of the medal, which I think was given to a member of his unit. Now, America can't change what happened to Henry Johnson. We can't change what happened to too many soldiers like him who went uncelebrated because our nation judged them by the color of their skin and not the content of their character. But we can do our best to make it right. In 1996, President Clinton awarded Henry Johnson a Purple Heart. And today, 97 years after his extraordinary acts of courage and selflessness, I'm proud to award him the Medal of Honor. I should point out, too, that there, uh, there had previously to this been another black man who had been awarded the Medal of Honor. Freddie Stowers was awarded the Medal of Honor by George H.W. Bush uh, during his administration, which was, you know, what, 20 years plus earlier to this. Um, but still... It should not have taken 97 years for Henry Johnson to get a Medal of Honor. We are honored to be joined today by some very special guests, uh, veterans of Henry's regiment, the 369th. Thank you to each of you for your service. And I would ask uh, Command Sergeant Major Lewis Wilson of the New York National Guard to come forward and accept this medal on Private Johnson's behalf. The 
President of the United States of America, authorized by Act of Congress, March 3rd, 1863, has awarded in the name of Congress the Medal of Honor to Private Henry Johnson, United States Army. Private Henry Johnson distinguished himself by extraordinary acts of heroism at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while serving as a member of Company C, 369th Infantry Regiment, 93rd Infantry Division, American Expeditionary Forces on May 15, 1918, during combat operations against the enemy on the front lines of the Western Front in France. In the early morning hours, Private Johnson and another soldier were on sentry duty at a forward outpost when they received a surprise attack from a German raiding party consisting of at least 12 soldiers. While under intense enemy fire and despite receiving significant wounds, Private Johnson mounted a brave retaliation resulting in several enemy casualties. When his fellow soldier was badly wounded and being carried away by the enemy, Private Johnson exposed himself to grave danger by advancing from his position to engage the two enemy captors in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Wielding only a knife and gravely wounded himself, Private Johnson continued fighting, defeating the two captors and rescuing the wounded soldier. Displaying great courage, he continued to hold back the larger enemy force until the defeated enemy retreated, leaving behind a large cache of weapons and equipment and providing valuable intelligence. Without Private Johnson's quick actions and continued fighting, even in the face of almost certain death, the enemy might have succeeded in capturing prisoners and the outpost without ab abandoning valuable intelligence. Private Johnson's extraordinary heroism and selflessness above and beyond the call of duty are in keeping with the highest traditions of the military service and reflect great credit upon himself, Company C, 369th Infantry Regiment, 93rd Infantry Division, and the United States Army. Henry Johnson's a hero. There are too many heroes like him that we've forgotten about, so I uh, uh, hope you'll take the time to learn more about these men. Uh, there's a lot of great videos uh, that go into much more detail uh, on YouTube about the 369th, about men like Henry Johnson and Needham Roberts and others uh, who were largely forgotten, and may we never, ever, ever forget them again. Thanks for watching.